John Sutter was a man driven to improve the world and make it better for the people. No matter the personal and physical toll, he was a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a soldier, and a peace activist. He was born on January 13th, 1926 in University City, Missouri. His father, Irval, was an attorney and a locally elected official. His mother, Anne, operated their small family bus business. As a child, John would campaign for his grandfather and father in St. Louis County. He would often speak about the activism of the Student Federalist Movement for world peace in the 1940s. He was inspired by their efforts to create world peace. He attended University Senior High School, which he graduated at the age of 16. He would later enroll in Washington University in St. Louis. He would study political science and international relations. Later, he would join the Reserve Officers Training Corps, or the ROTC. There, he would learn about artillery weapons. John's studies would be cut short because he would be drafted into the U.S. Army. After being drafted, John was sent to Fort Bliss in Texas. He stayed in Texas for five months and then was sent to Georgia to start his infantry training at Camp Stewart and Camp Gordon. John received his first assignment to Europe in January of 1945. He was shipped with thousands of other men to France aboard the Queen Elizabeth. It may have been disheartening to learn that they were replacements for casualties from the Battle of the Bulge. After 14 days on the ship, John would arrive in Lorraine, France. The division would move from Lorraine into Belgium, then into Nazi Germany. John said while in transit, his division experienced the cold winter of Central Europe, snow-covered tanks, and frozen mud roads. While going from destroyed and bummed town to the next, John learned about the tolls and casualties of war, the loss of life and of the hardship put upon the people is what instilled a sense of duty in John to fight for a better world without war. Soon, commands would come from Generals Bradley and Eisenhower to take Ludendorff bridge on Rhine River. A battle plan was drawn up. The goal was to figure out how to keep the Germans from blowing up the bridge so support troops could get to the other side in East Germany. The plan was B Company would advance to the other side to set up a bridgehead while C Company would protect them from intense artillery and aircraft fire. The next day, the Germans started bombing the bridge overhead with Suka dive bombers. Their efforts to stop the battalion became difficult because of the bad weather. But the weather also affected John and his company in their efforts to cover their guys. Two days passed, the Germans still didn't take down the bridge. So they decided to start shelling the bridge with 60 kilometer artillery mortar guns. 4,850 pound shells. John could see the big muzzles blast from two miles away. He said the shells gave off a noise between a freight train and a fire truck. All day the soldiers would go from protecting the other unit 
on the bridge to running for cover in a tunnel, hoping they didn't get hit by one of those shells. Then, John wasn't able to make it to the tunnel in time. A shell struck the ground, and he hit the ground right next to it. He felt something hit his face with the force of a sledgehammer. He looked up, and the bridge was hit. Thirteen men were injured by shrapnel from the shells. He noticed he was hurt. His mouth was shut from shrapnel. But John would still get up and run and return to safety underneath the tunnel. The mission to capture the bridge was a success. And the U.S. Army was able to send several divisions over the bridge to establish a bridgehead as planned. The 9th Division did something only accomplished by Napoleon's French and Caesar's Roman soldiers. On the 50th anniversary of the capture of the Ludendorff Bridge, John remembered a local speaking at an event say, We didn't realize it at the time, but we were most thankful that you liberated us from Hitler. To hear those words in that speech moved John and cemented his views of self-governance and the need for more democracy in the world. John was honorably discharged after reaching the rank of Staff Sergeant and received several medals for his services in World War II, including the Bronze Star for Valor in Combat, a Purple Heart, a Good Conduct Medal, and Battle Ribbons for his service in the war in Europe. After leaving the military, John would go back to Washington University in St. Louis. He would graduate with a bachelor's in public administration, then a master's in history and economics. He began focusing on a doctorate at Washington University. His focus would be on the United States of Europe. While working on his dissertation, John decided to take the Foreign Service Officer Exam, which he ended up passing. John would join the Foreign Service as a staff person, starting as a junior staff member in China to helping manage a U.S. consulate as an economic officer in Communist Indonesia. In China, John spent his time working behind the bamboo curtain with cabinet officials and Supreme Court members. Within just a month of being in China, John would experience the Chinese Civil War, a three-day battle in Shanghai with the Communist Army against the Nationalist Army, with the Communists coming up on top. As the Assistant Administrative Officer, he helped to evacuate the consulate's personnel. Even after all of that, John stayed in China for a year and six months as he rose from just a staff person to the position of vice consul at the consulate. When the consulate in Indonesia was reopened, John was sent there to assist in setting up the post in Surabaya. John once said, I liked Indonesians, but the post-revolutionary period was a time of many difficulties in Indonesia. After taking specialized Indonesian language and area training at Yale University, he was sent to the Jakarta U.S. Embassy in Indonesia. There, he would become the economic officer. John would leave the U.S. Foreign Services and move on to a new position with the Asian Foundation, where he served them for 31 years as the director of program management. 
he was able to work with governments and people from Malaysia to Pakistan. His work in the foundation led him to San Francisco in 1987. That was the same year John would join the U.S. World Federalist Association. Though John had been around the world and served in many government roles dealing with geopolitics, he decided to officially become a globalist and a world federalist by joining the World Federalist Association. The World Federalist goals were to abolish war, all crimes against humanity, the preservation of the environment, and the creation of forcible world law for all. These ideas connected with John's experiences as a soldier, a foreign service agent, and student writing about the United States of Europe. But now things changed. He wasn't seeking to only create a united Europe or improve government relations, but something greater a united world. John started as the editor of the quarterly Northern California World Federalist, which was later renamed Tor Democratic World Federation. He would later become the World Federalist Movement Northern California's treasurer, vice president, and then president. He also served on the board of directors liaison committee and policy committee of the World Federalist Association from 1989 to 2003. He also served on the Council of the World Federalist Movement from 1991 to 2007. There he headed the WFM's Committee on Federalism and the Right of People to Self-Government. John was able to continue his work in writing and editing toward Democratic World Federation, now known as the DWF News. John stepped down as the president of the Democratic World Federalists in 2012, but still stayed on as a board member until his last days. John was an intellectual, and at the Sunday monthly DWF board meetings, he would quote Socrates, Aristotle, John Jay, James Monroe, and many of the other great thinkers in history, as if he had never lost a step. He would often ask about youth movements like the Young European Federalists, Justice Democrats, and the Sunrise Movement. John said that we as Americans should be spending time and money on training and educating young people for working towards a peaceful world instead of throwing away trillions of dollars towards war. He also thought that more young people should join the Peace Corps, nonprofits, and NGOs, working with people in other countries to make the world a better place and to oppose military action. John, he wanted the people of the world to know that we all are part of the human family. And though we have cultural, religious, and philosophical differences, if we all work together, the world would be a better place for all and all people to live in it. He would also want people to know that we can establish a government organized that serves all people of the world, not dependent on those at the top. Till his last days, his mission was to create world peace in a democratic world government.
John, we will miss you. And we will salute you, sir. We will always honor you. And we will never forget you. 